Well, nobody's having a good time when the weather's really hot, but it doesn't have to be dangerous. You know, the truth is that heat stroke is completely preventable, and if you know what to do, you can save a life. Wait, you're such a silly girl today. Why are you jumping around like this? Anyway, so she pants, and like most dogs, <laughs> uh, like most of us, we're going to sweat, and really dissipating heat is about the cooling effect of water vaporizing from the surface of, in our case, the skin. And we have lots of surface area, some parts of our bodies sweat more than others. But cats and dogs don't sweat. Horses sweat, but dogs and cats don't. And I'm going to talk mostly about dogs because cats very seldom get heat stroke, and I'll mention how that has been known to happen. But dogs, of course, pant, as we all know, and that's about evaporating moisture off the surface of their tongues and their gums, but mostly the area of the throat called the pharynx. And so they move air back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to, to you know, vaporize the water and to cool. And in most cases, if they have plenty of good shade and plenty of water, it can stay plenty hot and they typically do okay. But we're going to talk about what to do when there's a real problem and how to recognize it. Uh, so you're equipped to, uh, to save a life if you need to and to prevent all that trouble. And by the way, in case we haven't met, I'm Dr. Jeff Nickel. I'm a veterinarian. I'm residency trained in veterinary behavior medicine, but we're not talking about behavior this time. I have many, many years of emergency work and, the, and also the treatment of illnesses and injuries. And in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I've practiced, um, we've seen plenty of heat stroke here. And it's so tragic and so unnecessary. Okay, so anyway. Um, so what are we supposed to be doing with this thing? I mean, how do you know you've got a problem? Well, you know, if a dog is getting hot um, but doesn't have heat stroke, the temperature is going to be around 103. But when it hits 106, then you have a heat stroke problem. And normal for a dog is 101 plus or minus about a half a degree. And, you know, I don't know about you, but most of us have these little digital thermometers that you can get at any pharmacy. This one was sort of the deluxe kind. It was like 15 bucks. But it gives you a temperature read in like a few seconds. The cheaper ones you can get for $5 or so takes a little more time. But they're all quite accurate and they're all worth using and having on hand because when in doubt, get a rectal, get a rectal temperature. So, uh, you know, uh, what are we supposed to, uh, how are we supposed to know who's more likely to have a problem? Well, dogs and cats can be outside in the hot weather if they have shade. You know, you can get these these misters, especially for uh, dry climates like, like the Southwest, that uh, spray a little mist around a, a porch, they can be really very helpful. But fans, many people whose dogs are outside, you can plug a fan in out there in the shade, no problem. Obviously, lots of fresh water. But you know these breeds that have these pushed-in faces like Bulldogs and Pugs and Pekingese, Boston Terriers? It's called a brachycephalic skull type. And they just don't move air very well. Um, it's a, sadly, a, a man-made breed. Oh, excuse me. And, um, you know, this kind of a normal shaped head like Miss America has here, they've got a lot more space in their throats and their, the opening into their airways is much bigger. But these pushed in face breeds have lots of folds of extra tissue and boy we're putting them at a disadvantage in the hot weather and those are the dogs that if you feel that gee it's a hot day well that one ought to stay inside an air-conditioned house in fact you know we let miss america go wherever she wants and even when it's 100 degrees very often she wants to be outside but we let her in when well when we feel she should come in or when she wants to come in so being hot outside doesn't necessarily mean you got to have a problem but humidity that's not our friend. And neither are these thick coats, especially on black dogs and big black dogs, because when they've got a lot of volume of their body, there's a ratio difference between that and the surface area of their body, and so they can build up heat much faster than a smaller dog. And being black or dark brown in color, they can absorb heat much faster. And on top of all that, um, if they're thick coated, they can get matted. And, you know, everybody's busy, and we sometimes don't pay close attention to our dog's hair coat. But in the summertime, that matted hair just, it's not capable of separating 
and laying open so as to, you know, allow good ventilation of the skin. It, it's like a, well, it's like a rug, and it and it traps heat on the skin, so we build up heat faster in the body. So matted coats, not a good idea. So the dogs who should be kept indoors in air conditioned uh, on the hot days are the big guys and the pushed in face brachycephalic breeds like the uh, Bulldogs and Bostons and Pugs and those guys, okay? High risk. Um, cats on the other hand, the, the only time I've ever seen a case of heat stroke in a cat um, was not in the, in the summertime at all, it was around Christmas. Got an emergency call. It was actually our, our staff's Christmas outing. And uh, we were uh, at a comedy club. And this was not a joke because I got a call and I took it, of course, and one of our better clients, um, they had made the mistake of taking a load of laundry out of their clothes dryer, you know, the front loading kind. And you know, cats, you know, the, the old thing about a cat trap, you just put out boxes and of course they jump in because it's a, a den-like environment. Well, this dryer's open and it was kind of cool because it was in December and, the, um, and it was warm in there. So the cat just jumped right in and without thinking of it, the folks took their laundry, yeah, you know where this is going, out of the washing machine, tossed it in the dryer, closed the door and fired up that dryer and that cat's in there. Uh, got overheated and of course got beat up pretty badly too and they realized it and we were able to actually turn that one around. But this cat had burned, I mean anyway, you don't want to hear the details, but they recognized that it didn't sound normal. But that cat, you know, the, the dryer, but the cat wasn't in there that long and its temperature was up around 106 when we met them at, the, uh, at our veterinary hospital. But uh, they acted quickly and you know, just like everything else, if you recognize it or you think you recognize a problem, don't just wait and see, you know, get a rectal thermometer. And when in doubt, um, get after it with a hose. Um, this kind of a, a little pistol type of an affair that we put on our garden hose, take that dog outside and mist them down. You can immerse them in a tub. Um, you don't want super cold water, um, cool water. Uh, but if it's super cold or putting ice on the dog or ice on the dog's foot pads, that causes the blood vessels to constrict and they're not capable of dissipating heat as fast. One of the other ways that's actually pretty darn effective after you've misted them with water or put them in the tub is you can get these like, you know, three by three type gauze pads or a little bigger, a little smaller, doesn't really matter. And then you can get isopropyl rubbing alcohol, which is gonna look backwards, <laughs> but you know, isopropyl. This is available at any pharmacy. And you go ahead and put this on the gauze pad and then you go ahead and, you know, you soak these three by threes and then you put them between the dog's foot pads and they can, um, well, you're, not, you're a little fussy about that, but also you can get these and put them um, in the dog's armpits and then the dog's groin. And the reason that those are good locations is there's just not as much hair and the body can dissipate heat from, the, um, from those areas as well as the dog's panting. So what are the symptoms? I mean, how do you know that you really got a big problem besides their body temperature? Well, again, it, the panting is not only continual, but when we've got a heat stroke problem, there's a lot of excessive salivation. I mean, it's pretty much hanging off them. And when they're panting so fast that they're trying to move all the air they can to, dis to, to evaporate all the moisture they can, um, they're not really taking lungfuls of air for normal breathing purposes, and their tongues can start to get purple. Um, now, a lot of dogs aren't necessarily got heat stroke just because their tongue's a little purple, um, but it is one indicator. Typical dog with, that's super hot, like 106, their gums, instead of being a normal pink, like, I don't know if you can see, can you see this, girls? Gums here? If you do, they're, they're pretty good healthy pink red, but they get super dark red when we've got a serious heat stroke problem. And by the way, I got a question coming up and anybody who has one or, or a story, Richard, very important. Yeah, that, boy, you, that's right, you stay ahead of this thing, really. That's what your comment is all about. So we, um, we check their gums, um, but also what we call the mentation of the dog. If the dog is you know, panting hard and heavy because it's hot and you say, come on over here and she gets up and jumps into your lap or comes near you and acts pretty normal, well, chances are things are okay. But when a dog has got a serious accumulation of heat and their body temperature is spiking um, and you try to get that dog to move, they're not interested in going 
anywhere because any movement at all would generate just a little bit more heat and they just a tiny bit more could push them over the edge and kill them. And again, this is such a severe problem potentially that we can cause multiple organs to fail. And in fact, when they get super hot, they'll develop seizures. And one of the biggest problems that we can have is brain damage, uh, kidney damage, liver damage. So uh, when in doubt, uh, you know, take a rectal temperature. So other risk factors, obesity, that's nobody's friend. Um, dogs who run the fence. Uh, one case that I had shortly after I graduated from veterinary school uh, was in a place called Corrales. It's a little village near Albuquerque. It's kind of a farming community. And uh, this man came in who was a breeder of these uh, German wire-haired uh, pointers. And um, he had a male dog, a breeding male, unneutered, uh, in a fenced area, and immediately next Next, in, the, in the yard right next to that fenced area was a female dog who was in season. Well, you know, many dogs have pretty good sense when it comes to protecting themselves, but he got highly excited and this fellow wasn't letting them breed. And so he was just running that fence, getting just highly agitated because well, it's natural. But it was a very hot day and he spiked his body temperature and he ran in with that dog and uh, we did everything we could and he he got there a little bit late. So, um, uh, so <laughs> don't let that sort of thing go on. Um, be very, very careful. Um, I just got a uh, suggestion, by the way. Any tips on taking a rectal temperature? And yeah, it, it's helpful to have two people and to roll the dog or cat on its side. Don't try to have them, you know, on a, like a sphinx position on the floor because you've got to reach under the tail and you can't see what the heck you're doing. So you roll them on the side, and if you have one person just kind of holding the dog's shoulders and head, then the other person get a little bit of any kind of lubricant, uh, you know, KY, Vaseline, cooking oil, butter. Hey, you know, if you're in a if you're in a trouble, you can toss the butter out, okay? And you get this good and, and lubricated, and raise that tail and raise it up pretty high so you can see the anus. Um, there is no hair on the anus. The the tissue around it is hairless, and if you're in a good light and the dog is on its side and you raise that tail good and high, then you can slide this in. And it shouldn't be uncomfortable. And again, with these newer thermometers, you know, you can see that little shiny metal part at the end. That's the only part that needs to go into the dog's rectum. You don't have to put the whole darn thing in. So they make it easy to do this uh, without discomfort, and, uh, and you can take their temperature often. So let's say you have a dog and you've made the diagnosis. We have heat stroke. Um, hose that, that puppy down, uh, immerse him with water, use the alcohol and the three by threes as you're putting this dog in the car. I mean, this is a two person operation, especially considering that most dogs who become uh, stricken with heat stroke are large breed. You need a couple of people, one to drive and the other one to be doing this kind of stuff with the isopropyl alcohol. and uh, take off for the veterinary clinic. It's smart to call on your cellular phone to let them know you're coming so that they're ready. Um, and bring a thermometer. And if you get after this early, you might see the temperature start to come down. But you stop the, all of this stuff, the water, the alcohol, the whole works when you get down to 103 degrees. Because if you keep going after that, you say, well, gee, normal's 101, let's keep going. The thermal regulatory mechanism of the body gets, loses control of itself and they can go way below and that is quite dangerous too. So when we're cooling them off, even in the hospital, or we're running IV fluids and oxygen uh, through a nasal catheter and, and these other methods of stabilizing them, when we hit 103, my guideline in practice had always been about 103.5, then we, we stop all that stuff and um, we allow the body to start readjusting to this kind of thing. So be, uh, be watchful, but don't, uh, don't do anything particularly dumb. <laughs> Fans are great, especially if, there's, if you've got the dog wet and you've got a fan blowing on it, then the dog can dissipate a lot of heat from the surface of its skin because the fan is blowing, the, uh, blowing air past all that water on the skin and it can evaporate. Similar to what, we, what goes on in the dog's throat, it can evaporate from, uh, from the skin that way. So 
That's what I have to share about heat stroke. Um, you know, one other point, by the way, you know, everybody talks on the news stations and billboards and all that kind of stuff in the summertime is don't leave a dog in a car. Even with the windows cracked open a few inches, the temperature can top 120 or 150, and that's all very true. And that when it gets that hot in a car in the summertime, um, heat stroke can occur extremely quickly. But if, if you see a dog in a parked car in the summertime, and yeah, the windows are open, um, and you can look at that dog, and it's panting, but its gums look okay, and it's not drooling like crazy, and it's active, I would, you know, give it just a couple minutes and see if the person didn't just duck into a store and come back out in three minutes or something, because that's okay. If it's a real brief trip, it's okay. Um, you know, the idea of breaking windows and calling the police and getting people into a whole lot of trouble because they ducked into a store literally for just a few minutes, well, that's not really fair. Um, but on the other hand, if, if the gums are a, a deep red or worse, they've gotten purple, uh, the dog is hardly responsive, well, you don't waste time on that. And even if you don't have your thermometer and, and your hose and your alcohol and the rest of it, uh, you can save a life if you move fast. Um, and then people can figure out what happened to their dog later. So anyway, thank you for all that. And, and I'm going to post this on, on my Facebook page, of course. And if other questions come up, by all means, you're welcome to post them on there and I'll address them all. Um, and every week, by the way, my Facebook Lives on Tuesday mornings show up in people's email boxes along with my question and answer media column from the Albuquerque Journal each week. Um, and all you have to do to get that stuff automatically is to go to my website, which is drjeffnichol.com, D-R-Jeff-N-I-C-H-O-L.com, and just sign up. It's no cost, of course, and when you do, I will send you my free at-home pet first aid and CPR guide, um, which includes lots of ways to save a life at home. Um, and next week, by the way, I usually do these things every week. Um, usually on Thursdays, and tonight's Wednesday, and the reason we're doing it in the evening early is that I'm, I've got, I loaded up my schedule with, with behavior consultations the next couple of days because next week I'll be in Washington, D.C. for a continuing education all week long. The first uh, four days of it is all behavior presentations. Uh, the International Veterinary Behavior Meeting takes up most of that. Uh, but also I'll be attending some general medicine because all of that intertwines together. The brain, where all behavior comes from, doesn't operate in a vacuum. All body systems work together, don't they? Yeah, you're upside down again. And so, and my cats are on the floor. Is it more comfortable there, gentlemen? Nobody's, nobody's jumping around up here for food and toys right now. So anyway, I'll be gone next week. So the week following, on that Thursday, which um, I have to admit I don't know what the date will be, two weeks from tomorrow, oh, Gaston, um, but we'll be back with another Facebook Live. And I will probably pick a topic uh, that just struck me in the continuing education and research that I'll be exposed to. Um, I like to bring out stuff that's, uh, you know, leading edge, um, stuff that you're not going to catch anyplace else quite as fast because, you know, subscribing to uh, uh, research journals and attending these things that are often presented Long before they get into print, I'm able to share information that uh, you might not see elsewhere for quite a while. So I'll find a good subject that I think everybody will find helpful. So I'll see you folks back in, in two weeks. So thank you, and uh, have a safe summer. And I hope the heat isn't a huge problem for everybody. My panting border collie here. That's right. <laughs>